I did a big video a couple of months ago covering the entirety of Data East's 1980s arcade output, and it looks like you folks really enjoyed that. So we're doing it again, only this time we're looking at a much more lauded studio. Yep, it's time for Konami. I've done a fair few Konami-centric vids in the past, whether it's the licensed arcades they released or ports of their arcades to the Spectrum, but this is an altogether much bigger deal. Today we're looking at every Konami 1980s arcade game. That's going to consist of 84 different entries, a fair amount of which are stone-cold classics. Some of the most influential and most successful arcade games of all time can be found in this video, make no mistake. However, there's more to be found than just the classics. There's quite a lot more obscure games that never ended up leaving the arcade floor, some murky early titles, some real hidden bits of excellence and, yeah, there's a couple of games that are better left forgotten. It's certainly going to be a wild ride, that's for sure. Now I'm going to do things a little differently here. This is, once again, largely going to be an A to Z. But when we do get to those big series, the likes of Gradius, Contra, Track and Field and what have you, we will be covering those games in the order of release. So with that in mind, well, we've got quite a lot of games to go through, so we best get on with it. We kick things off in rather simple fashion with a game called 600 from 1981. This game's actually got a couple of other titles depending on who released it. Stern called it Turtles and Sega called it Turpin, but seeing as how Konami developed the game originally, we're going with 600. This is an okay enough maze game. You're a mother turtle in a big parking garage and you've got to pick up the little baby turtles, all of whom are in mystery boxes that could either contain your offspring or another car to race around the track and potentially flatten you. Just as in real life, the mother turtle has a supply of bombs that she can release in order to blow up any motor that's on her tail. This is hardly the most famous Konami game that involves animals, but eh, it's not terrible. Just one of many average games that are in the Pac-Man vein. Ajax from 1987 is the first of many shooters that we're going to be looking at. This is the one where you play as either a helicopter or a jet, and if you played this in Europe then you would be calling the game Typhoon. The main gimmick of Ajax is that it switches between styles. When you're the chopper, you're playing a regular top-down shoot-em-up, but when you're the jet, you're dive-bombing down from the clouds, with scaling and rotation effects that makes it look like a paired-back version of one of Sega's Super Scaler titles. The game itself isn't exactly one of Konami's best shooters, to be honest. It's the sort of thing where you kinda wish that Konami had just picked one vehicle to base the game around, rather than trying to do two different types of shooter, neither of which ends up landing. That said, some people do enjoy this one a fair bit, so your mileage may vary. I just think it's kind of middling compared to some of the other shooters we're going to see in this video. Here's the first rather famous 80s Konami arcade that we're looking at, Amidar from 1981. While Amidar again follows in the wake of the almighty Pac-Man, it's playing quite a different sort of maze game, one that's defined as grid capture. Basically, you're on this lattice maze and you have to fill the gaps with solid colours by making your way around them. The game has a very clear set of rules when it comes to the movements of the enemies, it allows you to jump them when you get desperate and need to go under one of them, and there's also levels where you have to play as a paint roller, attempting to fill those holes as quick as possible so you don't have to go back and get more paint. This was a hugely popular title, one that made its own significant impact on the maze genre, and admittedly it's a game I'm quite awful at and haven't ever quite been able to figure out. That said, I can't exactly argue too much with its influence, I'm just rubbish. We're going even earlier for our next title because it makes sense to cover the few Konami games that were released in the very late 70s. This is Astro Invader from 1979. 
also known as Kamikaze. It's the first video game to be released by the Chicago-based Stern, who were much better known as major players in the world of pinball. In the world of Konami itself, this is one of the first video games by them that's available for us to play on MAME, released in Japan by the rather short-lived publishers Lejack, who we'll be chatting a bit more about later. We do know of and have the odd flyer for even earlier games with titles like Blockyard, Spacekin, Car Chase and Richman, although a lot of these appear to be either breakout clones or official variants of games such as Head On, Space Invaders and GB, playing the exact same as the originals. Anyway, this game here is a bit of a take on the Space Invaders formula, but with a neat twist. The alien ships are dispensed from a big UFO and they gradually assemble in wells up top, with a counter that tells you how many more ships the UFO's got. If you let one of these ships hit the ground that you're on, it blows up, taking you out if you're either near it or obviously if you're directly under it. Smaller UFOs also suddenly make their way to the ground at points. These must be dealt with immediately, because if they hit the ground then they'll kill you outright, no matter where you are. This does get pretty intense quite fast, more so than the original invaders, and I actually find it rather likeable. We're only five games in, and already we're getting something very odd indeed. Badlands from 1984. This is Konami's only Laserdisc game, their own very rushed contribution to the short-lived arcade craze. How rushed? Well, even for a Laserdisc game, it's quite simplistic. You only get one big old button marked shoot that you have to press at very specific times with scant time windows and precious little warning. Konami clearly wanted to make a Laserdisc version of Nintendo's classic Wild Gunman, that is the original 1974 electromechanical game as opposed to the later NES title, but yeah, this doesn't exactly make you feel like a cowboy seeing as Konami didn't even bother to include a gun on the cabinet to act as its button, which again screams of rushing to try and desperately get on that Laserdisc wave before it broke and rolled back. The quality of the animation is fine with some rather hilarious deaths, the plot gets very weird and the voice acting is appropriately terrible, but as with 95% of these games, you're better off just pulling up a YouTube video and watching it there rather than actually trying to play it. Konami did, at around the same time, work on another Laserdisc game called Max Mile and there's even a flyer kicking around for that one, however it appears that that game never actually came out. Here's another Space Invaders styled game, but we're actually going all the way forward to 1987. Batalantis is a fantasy themed title where you're positioned somewhat precariously on a ledge and you have to stop the various hordes from reaching your position. If they do then you're kind of screwed. I have to say that I really struggle with this one. Konami definitely makes some tough games, but this one in particular is seriously challenging. It almost feels like you have to be perfect from the start when dealing with these waves of enemies, otherwise at least one is going to get on your ledge and that's all it's going to take. While most of the studio's 80s games are going to be damn fine ones, to me this isn't one of them, and I can see why it's quite an obscure one nowadays. Now I say that most of these games are going to be fine, but then here comes Black Panther, another 1987 game. This is one of the worst games in the whole video, although it is terrible in a rather hilarious way. You do indeed play as the aforementioned Panther, and you claw and scratch at whatever comes at you. There seems to be some attempt to give this big cat some realistic movement, which is perhaps one of the reasons why this game is an absolute mess. I mean, it feels kind of unfinished, you get knocked around everywhere, the enemy sprites occasionally seem to magically teleport about. This is a really, really stupid game, even by arcade standards. That said, it's one of those that's so stupid that you can at least laugh at it a bit. It shows that Konami were certainly capable of letting out some quite strong guffs to go along with their classics. 
Up next is our first sports title. It's still 1987 and it's time for the justly famous Blades of Steel. Now, a common theme with a lot of these sports games is that they're probably more famous for their home versions as opposed to the arcade. That's especially the case with Blades of Steel, which, on the NES, well, for me, it's one of the most enjoyable and riotous sports games ever made. A work of sheer brilliance. Is the arcade version the same? Yeah, not quite. It's still good, but I find there's a lot of things about this arcade version that I miss. Specifically, I miss being able to straightforwardly control a goalie, and the trackball controls can be a bit of a pain. It certainly simulates sliding around on the ice quite nicely, but I would be happier with a plain old stick. You do naturally get better graphics and a bunch more commentary here, but it just doesn't play as well. Still, you wouldn't have one of the greatest 8-bit games of them all without this arcade original. Oh, and the commentator will say the initials of your team during the game, a fun little feature that I am sure no one ever used for anything even remotely immature. Face-off, get the pass! F-U-K is on the wing! F-U-K can dazzle! Oh! The ruse and check! Block Hole takes us to 1989 for some puzzling action. In its home of Japan, this game was known as Quarf. Block Hole is obviously one of many puzzle games that were inspired by the juggernaut success of Tetris, but I reckon this is one of the better efforts. It's a hybrid of Tetris style play and Space Invaders, where you have to shoot blocks up into other larger sets of blocks, disappearing them by making them up into large squares or rectangles. I quite like this because it encourages accuracy and efficiency as opposed to going gun-ho with your blocks. You have a wave of them coming at you and you have to decide, very quickly, the best way to attack them. And even if making a mistake isn't necessarily the end, it's going to lead to you making a much larger shape than you actually needed to. Getting through the waves properly with just the right amount of blocks fired is actually quite satisfying. A very simple looking game, and certainly not an arcade looker, but it's nice. While Konami did a good few sports games, they've only graced us with a single baseball title from the 1980s, one bottom of the ninth from 1989, also known as Main Stadium. And yes, this is the original version of said game. Konami did release another game with the same name a few years later for 32-bit platforms. So where does this title rank in the pantheon of endless Japanese baseball games? Well, it's a very mid one indeed. Bottom of the ninth is, in fact, a little too simple. It's actually quite easy indeed to hit the ball, and there's not a whole lot of variation either in where said ball ends up or in how you pitch it to the opponent it very quickly becomes repetitive. If you're bashing those balls and hoping that one of them ends up being a base hit or a home run, or you're fielding on a single screen pitch that does feel rather basic indeed for the end of the decade. In the end, this is just one of about 3,000 or so thoroughly avoidable baseball games. Time is running out. Home run! Up. We're still doing sporty fins, only this time it's on a track, and we're in a very expensive bit of machinery. Checkered Flag is from 1988, and it's not to be confused with the ancient ZX Spectrum race of the same name. I mean, why on earth would you do that at all? This is, in fact, a top-down racing game. Now, usually this is a type of racing that I am utterly dread for that, but Konami are actually very good at these. The thing that makes Checkered Flag a lot more playable than a lot of these twisty bird's eye view games is that it flexes the arcade hardware a little. When you have to turn, you're actually controlling the rotation of the camera more than the car, meaning that your vehicle stays in the centre of the screen and said corners and hairpins become a lot easier to handle at speed. It's still got a nice difficulty curve, of course, particularly as later tracks put you into even faster and trickier cars to handle, but it does what it does very well. 
Here's another one of Konami's good old classics, Circus Charlie from 1984. This is a running and jumping sort of game featuring six different events that you can pick from. They range from the relatively easy act of jumping through fiery hoops on the back of a lion to the incredibly tricky trapeze and beach ball stages. And it's the classic old thing of naturally wanting to get through each course as fast as you can in order to get a decent bonus, but most certainly not being able to tear straight through the level and having to hesitate and time your jumps carefully so that you don't fall flat on your ass. It's a very simple bit of platforming, but presented well and enjoyable for exactly as long as it needs to be. All the fun of the circus without any of the boring waiting around bits, although naturally you might want to give it a miss if you take a violent dislike to clowns. City Bomber from 1987 is another top-down car game, but this one's all about vehicular combat, in a similar vein to the old classic Spy Hunter, or indeed Konami's own Road Fighter that we'll be covering a bit later. The premise of this game is kind of odd in that you're actually playing as the bad guys. You pick up your mates who've just robbed somewhere like a casino or a bank, and then it's your job to get them to safety, shooting any other motor that gets in your way. You can also jump the car, which is naturally quite handy when it comes to gaps, but also for dealing with the odd sharp turn. It does feel quite souped up compared to the aforementioned likes of Spy Hunter from a couple of years previously, and it is in fact very fun indeed. Not a massively well-known game seeing as it never left the arcades, but definitely one to check out if you enjoy this little subgenre. And with that, it's time to go to school. Combat school, that is. Another game from 1987. This is an athletics game of sorts, but with a military aesthetic. It's obviously quite similar to the games from the track and field hypersport series, but different enough to stand on its own. There's several types of event here. The most standard one is the obstacle course where you bash to dash and jump at the appropriate times, but you also get some target practice, an Iron Man event that takes place from a top-down perspective, a spot of arm wrestling, and eventually a full-on fight with your instructor. Lose any of these even once and you'll get told to go home to your mother. This is the first example in the video of a game having quite a different name in America only. Over there, Combat School was named Boot Camp, and we'll be seeing a couple of other examples of this later on. The game itself, for what it is, is perfectly okay even if it is a bit more unforgiving than the likes of Track and Field. Fire! 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 Done! Fire! Go home to your mother! Nick? We're still in 1987, and we have another very significant title, the beginning of one of Konami's signature series. Of course, it's Contra. A whole new leap forward in the world of run and gunning, a classic where two big busty action heroes take on the Red Falcon organisation and end up hurtling into a world of big bases, big robots and aliens. Now while this is obviously much more famous nowadays on the NES, the original arcade Contra is still a major player, very successful in its time on the arcade floor even before it came home. Now while you wouldn't exactly be wrong for preferring the way the game plays on the NES, considering that it's a bit faster there, and the graphics do have a good bit of colour that the arcade kind of lacks, it's still a big old adrenaline rush. One thing that does tend to irritate people about this arcade version, mind you, is that it's in portrait mode as opposed to landscape, but then this original game does have a pretty even split between horizontal stages and vertical ones, not to mention the pseudo 3D base stages, and the latter two kind of work better in portrait. If you were in Europe, this game was known as Gwizor. Bill and Lance hadn't been replaced by robots quite yet, but the game was renamed in order to avoid any association with the ongoing Iran-Contra affair, something that Konami inversely wanted to milk heavily when it came to the American market. Because these aren't aliens, they're goddamn communists! Anywho, this is obviously great. 
Super Contra also made it to the arcades, coming out the very next year. Bill and Lancer's second and final arcade jaunt is, of course, largely more of the same. It's not as if the one-and-gun action needed a whole lot of improvement, seeing as Konami utterly nailed it the first time out, but this time the pseudo-3D stages have been nixed and replaced with straighter top-down stages that, honestly, are a lot more entertaining. You do get a bit more control over the height of your jump in this game as well, which can actually be very useful once you get to grips with it. The music here is bloody brilliant. While I think the first game's soundtrack didn't quite shine until it got to the NES, this one's just a hit right from the start. Once again, the same thing applies. While the NES home version, Super C, is the more famous one, and indeed the better game, Super Contra is still a great one and gun arcade romp. It should be noted that, unlike the original, Super Contra was released in Europe with its original title intact. It would be the last game in the series to come out under the Contra name until the release of Contra Legacy of War for the PS1 and Saturn in Europe in 1997. Next, we're going to 1989, where we've got Crime Fighters. At first glance, this seems like a pretty straightforward belt scroller beat em up, the sort of thing that was becoming all the rage at the end of the decade following the release of Double Dragon. And indeed, for the most part, Crime Fighters is a rather generic and pretty middling sort of game. Still, Crime Fighters is important in one sense in that while it wasn't Konami's first four-player game, this was their first four-player beat-em-up, coming out a few months before the release of the iconic Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and so it did set something of a path for the huge successes to come. This game is only so-so, although it does feature some amusing things like being able to grab a proper unlimited ammo pistol which, if you're good, you can basically use to breeze through an entire stage so long as you don't drop it. The direct sequel to this game was Vendetta, an absolute classic that would help cement Konami as one of the greatest beat-em-up makers out there, although sadly we won't be covering that one today. Things get much more plainer for our next title, Kubrick. This one is also from 1989 and, eh, it's just one of those rather annoying sliding block type games where you have to try and make a ball go through each and every one of said blocks and make sure it doesn't fall off. There is a better example of this sort of game coming up later on, but generally this isn't a type of puzzle game that I enjoy, and Kubrick does nothing whatsoever to change that. Honestly, the most intriguing thing about it is the rather odd name. Was it supposed to be a reference to old Stanley? He of Full Metal Jacket and Clockwork Orange and all of that? Eh, maybe, maybe not. Either way, it doesn't make this game a whole lot better. There's going to be a couple of games like this one in the video, but Dark Adventure is probably best described as Konami Does Gauntlet. Funny really, considering that Konami did make a game we'll see later on that could be considered one of the Atari Classics' forefathers. Once again, this game has a couple of titles. The original Japanese name is Meiju no Okoku, or Kingdom of Demon Beasts, and the European name is Devil World. Either way, this is an average one. It does look quite nice, but the gameplay is lacking somewhat, especially when you compare it to the almighty gauntlet. It just doesn't have the war speed, the imagination in its mazes, and honestly sometimes the amount of stuff going on leads to some really irritating slowdown, and that's just with a single player. I dread to think what it's like with the maximum of three. If you want to play this, I suggest going for either the Japanese or European versions. They do add a couple of improvements compared to the North American one, such as automatically starting with a ranged weapon and a Gradius-esque power-up system. It's still kind of mediocre though. Devastators is another pretty good title, this time from the middle of 1988. Take your Rambo-esque soldier and his unlimited ammo machine gun and rush your way through those stages. 
That sounds normal enough, but Devastators changes things up with a 3D view, one where your heroes are actually running into the screen. While this often draws comparisons with Tad Corporation's more famous Cabal, that game was actually released a month after Devastators. It would be more accurate to say that this is a souped up version of the base stages from Contra. Either way, this is a pretty enjoyable shooter. While for the most part I wouldn't say that Konami's 80s arcades are at the head of the pack when it comes to technical achievements, Devastators is still quite an impressive looking scalar title indeed, and the typical run and gun action works very well in this form. Mind you, it is another game that would be eclipsed by a later title. G.I. Joe, from a couple of years later, would be better than Devastators in pretty much every possible way. However, it wouldn't have existed without this original. It's time for more sports. And again, it's time for more sports that became more famous on the NES. We're hitting the court for Double Dribble from 1986. How does this spot of basketball hold up? Again, there are some odd things here that you may not be used to if you've just played the NES version. It is a bit annoying to repeatedly have to hit a button in order to actually move with the ball, but then you may expect that from the guys who made track and field. Still, Double Dribble does do plenty of good things. Having a noticeable difference between the players on your team for a start, which was quite unusual back then, all those ever so flashy dunk scenes. Still, the version of the game that came out in the home does have the edge. The freer movement just helps a great deal. However, there is one thing that it doesn't have over the arcade game. At this time, I wish to invite you all to please stand, as long as you can bear to, for the National Anthem of the United States of America. Take it away. This sort of thing is exactly the reason why I love covering 1980s arcade games so much. You simply don't get this brilliance anywhere else. Up next, well, it's the end. My only friend, the end. Amusingly enough, The End is one of Konami's very early arcade games, coming out in 1980 and once again published by Stern in the States. This is very much based on Namco's Galaxian, even one in on the Galaxian hardware. It's got a touch of Space Invaders too. Much like the earlier Astro Invader, you've got a big UFO at the top that constantly releases ships. You have a set of barriers that act as your cover, but rather than simply swooping down to try and attack you, the enemy crafts try and pick up bricks from said barriers, and they use them to gradually spell out the word, end. If they complete the word, then the game's over. Although naturally it'll also finish if you run out of lives before then. It didn't actually take long for arcade critics of the time to grumble about the sheer ubiquity of the single screen space shooter on the floor, but this is a decent example from the genre's heydays, and actually a fairly successful title as far as very early Konami stuff goes. Moving swiftly on, we have Fast Lane from 1987. This is quite a cool one. It's basically an updated take on the ancient and once very popular Sega arcade, Head On. You go round and round a level in your car, picking up people as you go and avoiding a big old truck that's coming the other way. Simple enough, but Fast Lane differs from the old Sega game in a very important way. You can also attack. Picking up the people increases your Gradius style power up bar and you can then use these abilities against the truck. Anything from jumping on them to a massive flash that will take out the enemy regardless of where they are on the screen. That's nice and it always comes with a satisfying little cutscene. Other than that, the play is basically just as it was in Sega's game and there's nothing particularly wrong with that even if it would be considered old fashioned by the standards of the time. Pretty cool really. 
The final round from 1988 takes us back into the world of sports. Although unlike a lot of Konami's efforts in the genre, this one never made it home. Kind of a shame seeing as this title, also known as Hard Puncher, is one of the best of them. This is, of course, a boxing game. You play as a fighter who looks somewhat like Rocky Balboa, and you've got a range of opponents, from guys who look like other famed Rocky opponents, to folks who look like the guys from Contra, to some other rip-offs of real-life boxers. Final Round works nicely because it's a bit more than just a flat-out button-bashing affair. It's got nice smooth movement and feels more like boxing in a way that something like, I don't know, Taito's Final Blow utterly does not. Funnily enough, Konami released another game a few years later with the exact same name for the PlayStation. However, that was a golf title as opposed to a boxing one. A very enjoyable and surprisingly deep slugfest for the time it was created in. From 1985, we've got Finalizer. It's another one of Konami's many shooters. The gimmick of this one is that you can use the power-ups to do the super transformation that's in the game's subtitle, changing your regular old jet into a big mech, complete with a shield to deflect shots. You do also get some other odd little power-up abilities here and there, such as the ability to stop the enemy's movement that you don't often see in a top-down game like this one. It's only an average game in the end compared to other shoot 'em ups of its silk, but it's not bad at all. Perhaps the most interesting thing about Finalizer is that it's very likely the earliest Konami game that was worked on by the legendary and rather enigmatic Hitoshi Akamatsu, the man who a couple of years later would go on to take the lead on the first entry in one of Konami's most legendary series, the original Castlevania. Our 26th game is... Eh, you know what, I don't even want to bother with a well, this is an obscure number joke. This is Frogger from 1981, and it's very rightly one of the most successful arcade games ever made. A huge title for Konami that helped make them one of the leading names on the floor, with Sega also rejoicing in its multi-million dollar success by publishing and distributing it. While this title doesn't exactly need a lot of hyping up, Frogger is still a joyous experience all these years later. I think if I was to pick just one thing to highlight about the game here, it would be all the many ways that our poor frog can meet his maker. He can get flattened by a truck, eaten by a crocodile, caught short by a submerged lily, taken into the abyss at the edge of the screen. Frogger is one of the first games to really embrace having a large amount of ways to die, especially for the time it was released in. Other than that, the simple act of trying to get your frogs up the board and into their homes on the riverbank is, in one word, timeless. Not only is Frogger Konami's best-selling arcade game ever with 60,000 units sold, the various home versions of the game sold a combined total of around 20 million copies. It is still the company's best-selling individual game by a long distance. <laughs> Moving on to something significantly less famous, Galactic Warriors from 1985 is at least still a pretty good title. This is Konami's second fighting game, coming hot on the heels of Yaya Kung Fu which is, as you might have guessed, the very last game that we'll be covering in this video. While this one is relatively obscure, it does contain a couple of fighting game firsts. Galactic Warriors is the first fighting game where you can actually choose from a range of characters, with three robots available for you to pick from. Each robot has a different set of moves. You get a punch, kick and a block, but you do also get a special move, and you'll likely cycle through all of these moves over the course of about very sharpish. It's not exactly the range of moves you would expect nowadays, and Galactic Warriors doesn't quite have the innate playability of Yaya Kung Fu, but it's still got some important innovations, and deserves its spot in the big old history of fighting games. 
Gunbusters, or Crazy Cop, is a 1988 game that never made it out of the arcade, which is kind of a shame as it's really good. This is a top-down one-and-gun type affair that's kind of similar in looks to the earlier City Bomber, even if that's a different sort of game. The usual shooting action is most certainly present, and done well, although the best thing about Gunbusters is that it all comes with a nice little sense of humour. You've got your rather odd-looking heroes named Smith and Wesson, <laughs> no, really, and you get your power-ups through catching various criminals in the act, whether they're dragging suspicious-looking sacks out of buildings, or simply counting their money in the middle of the street. Naturally, you then take these perpetrators off to the nearest paddy wagon for a points bonus. This is a very neat little arcade, and the cartoony aesthetic of it all certainly gives it a big boost. I would recommend this one if you've never heard of it before. Well, it's not too long before we come across another untouchable arcade classic. It's time to hit up Gradius, starting with the original from 1985. This is another definitive title, of course. An evolution of what Konami did earlier on with Scramble, Gradius is damn near as revolutionary as that title, what with its power-up system, the multitude of different stages, its uncompromising difficulty. It is the complete shoot-em-up experience. Again, if I were to focus on just one little, lesser talked about thing, there is perhaps only one failure that could have derailed it a little bit, that being its original hardware. In Japan, Gradius originally came out on some strange creation called the Bubble System, Konami's first attempt at a standardised system board that used bubble memory. You can tell if you're playing the game using this hardware because you get a warming up screen combined with this piece of music known as the Morning Theme. Very nice, very elevatory. Anywho, this hardware flopped. Operators complained that due to the nature of bubble memory, any electromagnetic interference could essentially wipe the board out, and said bubble system was soon scrapped. Any game that used it would soon be converted to regular old ROM chips. None of this was an issue for the overseas version of the game that came out as Nemesis, mind you. Anywho, Gradius itself was a total triumph, most certainly in its home of Japan, and also in the UK where it was actually the highest grossing arcade game of 1986, according to British operators and manufacturers Electrocoin. Coin. 1986's Salamander, or Life Force depending on where you are, is technically a spin-off of Gradius, but it's so damn close that we ought to cover it at the same time. It certainly differs from the Gradius formula in a few ways, dispensing with the game's famed power-up system in favour of just obtaining new options and weapons whenever you come across them, and including a mix of horizontal and vertical scrolling stages. The standards most certainly not slipped, that's for sure. Salamander is absolutely exceptional, with a heavily organic aesthetic that really shines through, stages that feel alive and often seem to grow in order to try and stop your progress. A tremendous game indeed, and of course, it's another tough one. This is probably a good time to note that a lot of Konami's arcade games don't let you continue at all, and that is certainly the case with all the 80s Gradius games. Vicious. You can at least adjust the lives counter in the dip switches if you need a bit of help, but Konami make tough arcade games in general. It takes a good couple of years for them to really start using continues at all, and even then you're often only able to use a limited amount of them. They're tricky, but in this example certainly, outstanding. The Gradius fun continues with the second proper game from 1988. The formula largely stays the same, but there are some additions including, most importantly, the ability to choose between sets of weapon configurations at the beginning. The core of the game is still very much there, but we do get a few improvements straight out of Salamander when it comes to the stages. Hell, the first stage in this game is quite a bit like Salamander's famous lava-based third stage. In the end there's improvements all over the shop, the music, the presentation are all absolutely wild here, as is the difficulty, 
because, well, who oh boy, is this game a tough cookie indeed, far more challenging even than the original Gradius. Still, you don't mind too much when the game's this good, do you? North American audiences were sadly deprived of this one. The original Nemesis wasn't as big a hit there as it was in Japan and Europe, and maybe Konami thought this would just be too challenging. As for the Gradius loving European audience, they would see this game on the floor, under the actually pretty cool alternative title of Vulcan Venture. Our final Gradius game in this video is, of course, Gradius 3. This title just about sneaks into Konami's 80s lineup, coming out right at the end of 1989 in Japan. As a matter of fact, Japan and Asia are the only territories where the arcade version of Gradius 3 would be released in, hence why this title is much more known in other places as a launch title for the SNES. What else is there to say here that's new? I mean, not an awful lot. It's still Gradius, it's still got all the classic stylings along with now being able to edit the weapon configurations to your personal preference, it's got some brilliant music with the opening track, Sandstorm, being one of the absolute elite shoot 'em up themes, the quality foundations are all there, and unsurprisingly Konami deliver the goods once again. As brutal as these games may be, you just can't knock a quick blast into the cosmos in a Vic Viper. When you play Gradius, and especially if you get in the zone with it, you feel as if you're right next to the beating heart of one of the most storied gaming genres. Legendary. Mitchell. We move straight along from Gradius to another almighty title, Green Beret from 1985. Not so much a run and gun game, more like a run and stab where you break through into that base, rescue the POWs, and do so by endlessly taking out the enemy's forces with your combat knife. Occasionally you kill a commander and pick up his weapon, whether it be a flamethrower or rocket launcher, but the shots are very limited, and they're best reserved for when you absolutely need them. What can I say about this one, really? It's one of my favourite Konami arcades, the relentless close-up action never lets up, the game's challenge is typically hard but just right, you've got thumping military music throughout, and there's also one of the best arcade ports of all time, the version of this game on the ZX Spectrum. There is also, of course, the alternative title. This is the most famous example of Konami changing the name of a game for the American market, rechristening it the ultra pally Russian attack and making it very clear that you're fighting against those darn Soviets. This is one of those arcade action titles that honestly, I'd find it very hard to find any fault whatsoever in. We do also have a Green Beret sequel to look at. MIA Missing in Action came out four years later, in 1989. This one never left the arcade, and as such is a lot more obscure than Green Beret, which was pretty much ported everywhere. Aside from the updated graphics and music, Missing in Action is largely more of the same. You're still stabbing enemy soldiers in their base and occasionally picking up limited use flamethrowers, machine guns and grenades, although the stages tend to be a little bigger, usually containing underground sections and the like. Also, this game has a simultaneous two-player mode, something that the original Green Beret did not have. How does this one fare? Well, it's certainly good, but not quite as awesome as the original Green Beret. Perhaps this feels a little old-fashioned for the time it was released in, and even if the gameplay of the original didn't exactly need a whole lot of improving on, maybe Konami could have done a bit more here than just recreating it. Still, if you want a bit more stab-to-start type action, here's a place where you can definitely find some. Well, if it's a Konami game and the title begins with G, chances are it's a pretty good one. Yet another classic is before us, Gyrus from 1983. 
notably one of a handful of games designed by the almighty Yoshiki Okamoto, later of Street Fighter 2 fame, during his time with the company, Gyrus is another of my all-time favourites. One of the freshest takes on what was, by 1983, a quite well-worn space shooter formula. Gyrus does follow a similar form to the likes of Galago in that you have a wave of ships that will dive down at you, but changes things up by taking place in a tunnel. The act of circling around this tunnel and firing down at the enemies definitely changes things, and also adds shades of Atari's legendary Tempest into the mix. It's such a captivating game for me, especially with its stereo sound and that music, a brilliant rearrangement of the instrumental band Sky's take on Bucks to cut on Fug in D minor, that's honestly one of my favourite ever arcade tracks. I absolutely love Gyrus to bits. Between this and the other Wokomoto game that we're going to be featuring in this video, the man would be an arcade legend for me even if it wasn't for the titles that he'd go on to make when he joined Capcom. We've had such a great run of fantastic games that, well, it is probably about time to get to something that isn't good at all, and I'm afraid it's time for Haunted Castle. The arcade version of Castlevania from 1988, Haunted Castle is an exercise in showing that even if something is absolutely brilliant in the home, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work on the arcade floor. This title turns poor old Simon Belmont, he's not named here but no other members of the Belmont clan had been introduced by this point, into a big, virtually useless slug with a flaccid whip and even worse sub-weapons. The difficulty of the original Castlevania is, of course, tough but usually quite fair once you learn how each enemy behaves. This just feels like the most unfair of slogs, the look of the title isn't exactly inspiring and having very limited continues doesn't exactly work out here at all. I mean, bloody hell, everything about this game is seemingly just designed to annoy the player. The music is at least generally quite good, but this is easily one of the worst ever entries in the whole Castlevania series. It's easy to see why it's been relatively forgotten. Hot Chase is something a little bit more on the obscure side, but it takes us to the track, well sort of anyway. This is an action-packed driving game where you're driving a white Porsche 959 out of enemy territory. The only trouble is that said car has a bomb attached to it and you need to get it out of said territory before it blows up, taking the odd risky jump, avoiding enemy choppers and so on. It's eh, not a bad game but not a very successful one. It's one of those games where the hardware used doesn't quite meet the game's ambition, which can often be the case with Konami. If you were to take a look at a list of the various boards and configurations they used for their 80s games, you would find them to be quite scattershot, it's as if they just used whatever was on hand. Still, this probably isn't the reason why Hot Chase is completely forgotten now. This game does get compared a lot to Taito's Chase HQ, some even saying that it's a flat out rip off. The truth is that this came out mere weeks after the release of Taito's game, so it's perhaps not a rip-off. It's more accurate to say that Chase HQ, being so much better in every way, blew Hot Chase completely off of the arcade floor. Them's the brakes, I'm afraid. We're staying on the road for our next title, Hyper Crash from 1987. This is another largely unsuccessful spot of driving, but it's more entertaining and more physical than the previous entry. Essentially all you do here is smash other cars into barriers until you run out of fuel. Blowing said cars up does give you a fuel boost, while barrels on the track are to be avoided. You can also do a big jump move that can allow you to smash even more cars up, but does cost a little bit of fuel to actually do. All good fun, really. It's not exactly the prettiest game, especially when compared to other racing games from the same period, your out ones and so on. But again, there might be a reason for that which speaks to my previous point about Konami being quite disorganised with arcade hardware. <laughs> 
Believe it or not, Hypercrash is another bubble system game, that rather short-lived flop system based on bubble memory, and it came out two years after all the other arcade games in that line. So yes, this is one in on pretty old hardware, the same sort of thing that powered the original Gradius and Galactic Warriors. An intriguing choice, I'm sure you'll agree. But hey, all that old bubble shit was obviously just sitting around getting in the way, and someone decided it had to be bloody used already. Regardless of that, this is still quite an entertaining and silly little game. Our next game is 1986's Iron Horse, also known as the Great Train Robbery in Japan. This one's actually very cool. You play as a desperado and you've boarded a train with the aim of taking all of its plunder. The end result kind of plays a bit like Green Beret, only with a Wild West theme. There's a similar intensity when it comes to dealing with all of the train's guards who want to stop you. The way it plays also differs considerably depending on what weapon you choose. Going with the pistol is probably what most would go for if it's their first time playing, although it can only take out one enemy at a time, and the whip actually might be a better choice for beginners. Whereas if you really want to feel like a badass cowboy, make the choice to get right up close with your fists. Robbing a train with no weapons at all? Yeah, that's a pretty satisfying thing to do. In a video game anyways. It's not Konami's most famous journey to the West, but it is a damn good one. Jackal, also from 1986, is a much more famous title than the previous game, although a lot of that probably has to do with, once again, an excellent home port to the NES. The original arcade is definitely a winner, mind you. You break through each area in your jeep, using the big shells to smash enemy buildings and rescue the POWs inside in order to get power-ups, taking out other vehicles and installations with your bullets, running over any other goon who's trying to take you out. It's the sort of game that gives you the illusion of being unstoppable when you're playing well, even if it does only take a single well-placed shot from the enemy for you to get blown to smithereens because, well, this is a typically challenging Konami arcade game. The great music and presentation, along with the vehicle controls that aren't overly complex, do make this one of the better run-and-gun games of its type, one that's worth persevering with in order to try and overcome that challenge. Of note is that while this game did come out as Jackal on the NES in all territories, the North American arcade release did, once again, have a different name. It was called Top Gunner, presumably trying to get a bit of shine from the recently released Tom Cruise flick. <laughs> It's often stressed that Konami's 1980s arcade games can be very tough indeed, and well, this might be the hardest of the lot. I'm not sure if any of their other games quite reach the absolutely vicious challenge presented by Jailbreak. In this title, somewhat inspired by Escape from New York, a jailbreak has occurred somewhere in the town and you're the one copper tasked with stopping them, ideally rescuing hostages on the way and picking up weapons from them in a style that is, once again, kind of similar to Green Beret. However, this is a belt scrolling shooter, something a bit different in style to the norm. The huge difficulty in Jailbreak comes from the sheer vulnerability of your cop. Enemies are absolutely everywhere, they've all got their ranged weapons or even a spot of cover to help them out, and the slightest touch of a bullet will kill you outright. The extra weapons, the bazooka and the tear gas gun, can help, but when you're having to fire everywhere, it can be kind of easy to accidentally murder some civvy who stupidly run out into the road and that loses you said weapons. Jailbreak is a well-made arcade game for 1986, but perhaps this one's just too damn hard in the end to really be enjoyable. Oh no! I'm over here. Jungler is an altogether simpler affair, another one of Konami's early gems hailing from late 1981. 
It's a single screen maze game, but an altogether different beast to something like Amidar. You play as a big segmented snake, trying to outlast the other snakes on this course. The idea here is to shoot segments off the enemy and then make an attempt to devour them. You can automatically eat any snake who's smaller than you on contact, while naturally any snake larger than you will chow down on your sorry ass if you touch them. Helpfully the snakes are colour coded in a way that you can immediately tell who's bigger or smaller at a glance. Jungler wasn't anywhere near as successful as a lot of Konami's other games from 1981, but it's actually excellent. Once you figure out the way it works, it's a very compulsive little game, and getting the better of these enemies who, let's face it, all start out on the exact same page as you do, is a very satisfying experience. I'd highly recommend this one. Similar to Jungler, Juno First is another pretty good early arcade from Konami that wasn't hugely successful. This one's a couple of years later, from 1983. It is kind of odd in presentation. I'd actually describe it as one of Konami's most Western-influenced arcades, almost as if they're trying to make a game in the style of Williams with all the loud, boisterous sound effects and what have you. The game itself is a space shooter from a tilted perspective. The enemies appear from all over the place and you can move forwards and backwards to deal with them in a way that is kind of similar to the old Nintendo arcade radar scope. You can get some big bonuses if you pick up the astronaut. That stops the enemies firing for 10 seconds and you rack up a huge multiplier for however many ships you shoot down in that time period. This is a very nice game, although much like the aforementioned Radar Scope, it wasn't a successful one. I get the feeling that this one would have been if released a couple of years earlier, but as we start to head into the North American arcade crash, people were really getting tired of space shooters, and Juno first failed to make much of an impression. A shame, as it's a damn fine arcade. <laughs> The absolute best thing about doing these videos is when you find something obscure that is actually brilliant, one of those real big YouTuber face grade hidden gems that everyone should play right now. And that's what we've got here. Kitten Caboodle from 1988, also known as Nyan Nyan Panic, is one of the best games in this video. This is a single screen game that is somewhat similar to Sega's Pengo in that the aim is to push blocks around and crush enemies with them, picking up enough keys from their corpses to unlock the level's door. However, there's much less blocks available to be pushed than there is in something like Pengo, and at first this can be confusing. The key here is that our feline hero can jump over blocks, so often the strategy is to lure the critters in, jump the block and then crush them, ideally doing it in such a way that you can use said block again and not leave them dead on the walls of the stage. You can also create lines of special blocks for a bonus attack, which can be very handy indeed. Absolutely excellent game, this one. A brilliant and quite in-depth bit of puzzling, and it's a real shame that it wasn't far more successful. Play this one immediately. Alas, they can't all be hidden gems. Konami GT from 1985 is another obscure game, although not a good one. As the title suggests, it's a racing game, a somewhat strange one using the bubble system hardware where you've got a sort of inside the car view, something you don't often see at this time but kind of reminds me of the old Laserdisc Road Blaster game. It doesn't really help much with controlling the damn thing, if anything it makes it harder to avoid the various other cars on the track, which naturally will blow you the hell up if you make even the slightest contact with them. As you can probably tell, I don't care much for this one at all. While I appreciate that Konami were trying to do something a little different with this racer, you'd be much better off playing Heavy Crash, or even Hot Chase. This is sometimes thought of as the spiritual successor to the earlier game Road Fighter, however not being able to counter steer your way out of trouble kind of stops Konami GT from being considered a full on sequel. 
Speaking of obscure, the next game in the video is something that was never actually released. Here's Kokuka Bakugekitai, or Dive Bomber Squad, a title that was likely supposed to come out in 1989 and was exhibited at the Amusement Machine Operators Union show that year, but never made it to the arcade floor. Seeing as this is still a prototype, what we've got here isn't all the way working, but this appears to be a damn fine shooter, one that's chock full of rotation and scaling effects where you get through the levels by bombing the big targets on the ground. Naturally, the enemy's defences are going to make sure this is easier said than done. This game's got a lot of potential, and compared to some other titles, I do wonder why this one never ended up getting finished. It is a lot like Namco's excellent 1988 game Metal Hawk, mind you, so you are probably better off playing that instead. Looking at Mame Hazer's write-up on the game, I wonder if it's a case of Konami's hardware just not being powerful enough for what they really wanted to achieve here. The most notable thing about this game, however, is that a certain Hiroshi Ayuchi did the background graphics for it. This was his first project at Konami, and later he would join Treasure where eventually he would direct both Radiant Silver Gun and Ikaruga. The one itself has been available since 2016, is one of many prototypes that made its way to the public with the help of Showtime, the legendary Japanese arcade collector who has allowed many of his rare and unreleased PCBs to be preserved and made available, and it was dumped by Mamehaze. As is often the case, our next game is far less exciting. It's Locomotion from 1982. This is one of the earlier entries in the sliding block puzzle genre. You need to build those train tracks in such a way that the coach reaches all the stations that are on the edge of the grid. It's very similar to an old Mega Drive game called Junction that was released years later. I think this is considerably better than the previous sliding tile game we looked at, the utterly generic cube brick, but it is... Well, it's very slow. While that does make the endless tile moving a bit more manageable, I do really wish that there was a button that could speed the train up a little bit when you know you've got the placement of those rails spot on. That would make for a lot less waiting. And then when, after you've waited ages, the station you're aiming for suddenly closes off and the carriage ends up crashing? Well, that's bloody annoying, isn't it? Not badly made or anything like that, but certainly not one of my favourites. It's time to get into the squared circle. Yep, here's the main event from 1988, another bout of sport in action, and it's a wrestling game. Like most of the other arcade wrestling games of the time, this is based on tag team wrestling, and you pick two wrestlers out of eight to make up your team. Naturally, a lot of the folks here are based off of real-life grapplers such as Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, and Ricky Steamboat. The actual wrestling action is, to be honest, not very good. I can't say I care too much for this. The movement feels sludgy as hell, and the grappling is kind of incomprehensible. Nice to have some commentary at least, in much the same way that Blades of Steel and Final Round have it. The one good thing I can say is that this is Konami's first four-player game, beating Crime Fighters by a good few months. This sort of multiplayer action would become integral to Konami's arcade triumphs at the end of this decade and into the 1990s, so the main event certainly deserves some credit there. However, I can't say I enjoy this game at all. We're going back to 1983 for Megazone. Yes, it's good old fashioned shooting action. You play as an amphibious tank and you've got to blow the hell out of any target in your way. You really should know the drill here by now to be honest. This is kind of an obscure game today, which is a little shame as it's not bad at all. This does represent a bit of a step forward from the age-old single-screen space shooter, seeing as it's got the vertical scrolling and you're moving over all this different terrain and what have you. Unfortunately for Megazone, this also describes Namco's Exevius, which was released in Japan mere weeks before Megazone came out. 
Exevius was an arcade juggernaut that did all of this, only better, breathing a whole new lease of life into the shoot 'em up genre, and while Megazone manages to tread similar ground, alas, it simply could not compete with Exevius's popularity. Still, if you're interested in early shoot 'em up action, this title's not bad at all. It's just the sort of thing you would expect and want it to be by 1983 standards. Our next title covers all the bases. It's weird, it's got a lot of intrigue, and it's very good. It's time for Mikey to take the stage. He's from 1984, and he's here to cause lots of trouble. Mikey's got a very odd concept. You're a high school student, and you have to collect hearts. In the first stage, you do this by bumping your fellow students out of their seats, all while your exasperated homeroom teacher tries to stop you from disrupting everything. However, you can stop him by nutting him square in the bloody face. A totally acceptable thing to do, apparently. Just headbutt your teacher. <laughs> Why not? Other stages will have you causing a mess and chucking basketballs around in the laundry room, in the kitchen, and various other spots. Odd, but entertaining. Kind of hilariously messed up. One of the many odd things about Mikey is that whereas a lot of times Japanese games are sanitised for American audiences, this goes the other way. The original concept was changed altogether in Japan due to concerns about promoting violence in schools, meaning that this is the Japanese version of the game, Shinyu Shan Toru-kun. You're still headbutting everyone, but now you're a salaryman in an office building. Still pretty wild, it must be said. There is also a second, slightly cleaner version of the game for Western audiences, High School Graffiti Mikey. Here our hero's headbutt is replaced by a shout. This is actually much harder than the original, the shout has less range than the headbutt, and some of the adults are impervious to it. I'd go for the original Mikey instead. Oh, and I haven't even mentioned that this is all soundtracked by Beatles songs such as A Hard Day's Night and Twist and Shout. And yes, these are officially licensed versions of said songs, not rip-offs. As you can see, there's a lot to talk about here. And to me it's worth it, because Mikey is one of Konami's best and most underrated arcade games. For all of its anarchy and ridiculousness, along with its fine gameplay, I absolutely love this one. We're going to continue letting the weirdness in for our next title, which is actually important. It introduces another one of Konami's famous characters. This is Mr. Goemon from 1986. This arcade was only released in Japan, and it is Konami's first Goemon game. The characters based on the legendary Japanese outlaw Ishikawa Goemon, and for the British audience he's best described as the Japanese version of Robin Hood. Anywho, you need to get our outlaw hero from A to B in this platformer. Obviously lots of guards are going to come at you, but Goemon can stop these guards either by picking up items and chucking them around, or by twatting them with his big traditional Kiseru pipe, which Goemon happily takes a couple of puffs on between stages. A simple and fun little title that would be the first in a whole series of Ganbare Goemon games, or Mystical Ninja as they're known outside of Japan well, for the couple of entries in the series that came out outside of Japan anyway. Along with being the very first entry in a well-loved series, this is a pretty good arcade. We're back into the world of shooters for MX-5000, a 1987 game that's also known as Flak Attack. It's not exactly the best known Konami shooter, but it's quite a good one. The gimmick here is that while you spend most of your time flying around in the usual jet, you go down to the ground and become a tank for the boss fights. This is another game that never left the arcade, which is probably why it's not better known. A shame because along with the action itself being pretty good, this game also has a very neat soundtrack that's one of the company's sleeper gems. It's not exactly going to turn you on to shoot 'em ups if the genre's not your thin, but it's certainly something to check out if you're a fan. Mm -hmm. 
Pandora's Palace is another rather obscure title, this time from 1984. This is a single screen platformer in the vein of Donkey Kong and the like, and it's the answer to a challenging trivia question. This is actually the first Konami game to feature one of their signature enemies, that being the Moe statue heads. Also weirdly, Pandora's Palace never actually came out in Japan, only ever been released in North America, so it is certainly one of the company's most thoroughly unregarded titles. Again, that's a shame because it's actually not bad. You play as an unnamed Greek hero and you have to avoid the enemies that, instead of killing you on contact, are actually likely to push you into the direction of a pit or a fire. I presume that being released in the thoroughly diminished market of 1984 really didn't do this game a lot of favours, but it is worth a little look. Pin Pong from 1985 is Konami's entry into a sports genre that you would think would be suited to more games, a solid spot of table tennis. Still I suppose it's either this or Rockstar's game that would be considered the most famous table tennis video game of them all. This one can be tricky to get used to, but it is quite a lot of fun. The bat automatically moves towards the ball and you can change what sort of shot you want to do with the buttons, then actually perform said shot with the joystick. At first you are probably going to be spraying the ball all over the place, but this does get quite good once you're actually able to get into some serious rallies. The audience naturally cheers majorly for every point, and the eagle-eyed folk may be able to spot Pentaru lurking in there, Konami's penguin hero who made his first appearance a couple of years previously in Antarctic Adventure for the MSX. A cool title that, again, makes you think there should be more games based on Pinpon. We've largely got a run of good stuff at the moment, and game number 55 is another very well regarded title from the golden age, Puyan from 1982. I mean, how can you not enjoy this one? You play as a mother pig in a gondola and you're trying to stop these groups of wolves from kidnapping your baby piglets and, I don't know, turning them into some delicious leshon or whatever. The wolves try to get up to higher ground with their balloons in order to drop a big rock on your noggin, and you stop them with the help of either your trusty bow and arrow, or by chucking a massive slab of meat in their direction. This is the first game that one of the legends of the 80s arcade, Tokuro Fujiwara, directed. The almighty Professor F is certainly more famous for his later works at Capcom such as Ghosts and Goblins and Commando, but he started out with some damn fine games for Konami, this one being his most successful title there, widely regarded as a classic from the good old days. <laughs> We have two arcade pool games in this video. Some would regard this as too too many, although one of them is actually kind of influential. This is not that one. This is Rack 'em Up from 1987, also known as The Hustler, and well it's an arcade pool game. Try to pot those balls and complete the rack. You get three chances to pot a ball and you lose a life if you either don't do that or you end up fouling. As is always the case, if you've played one of these games, you've pretty much played them all. I do like how the game also includes a view from the queue so you can better see where you're actually aiming, and we do have the appropriately breezy jazz soundtrack, but this is always going to be something of a minor affair unless you're really into playing nine ball on an arcade machine. <laughs> Here's another one of my personal favourites. I absolutely adore Road Fighter from 1984. This was Konami's first racing game and it's another top down affair. Simple enough really, just get your car from point to point and don't run out of fuel. This is one of those games that just gets majorly addictive. The roads have a few twists in them but not enough to send your head spinning and so the main challenge comes from avoiding all the other cars while going at top speed. However, the real genius move is that hitting another car doesn't automatically mean crashing, most of the time anyway. 
you start to lose control, but you can correct your course by mastering the counter-steer technique before hitting the wall. Being able to do that, whether by knowing it in your bones or through sheer panic, is the key mechanic that makes Road Fighter very satisfying indeed. This is one of those arcade games that, if I ever see it, I pretty much have to play it, whether it's the original or the excellent port of the game for the MSX. An utterly brilliant game, this one. Rock and Rope is another platformer, this time from 1983, and one with a big twist. You play as an archaeologist who has to pick up tail feathers and return them to a golden phoenix, and you do so with the help of a harpoon gun that shoots ropes connecting to other platforms. That should sound familiar. This game was also made by Takoro Professor F. Fujiwara, and he would later expand further on this concept with the excellent Bionic Commando when he was at Capcom. Now as good as that title is, Rock and Rope isn't particularly one of my favourites, in the main because it's just so damn hard. The enemies come at you from absolutely everywhere, our exploring hero is very slow and has little in the way of defence aside from a rather short range light that stuns the enemies, and it almost feels like you have to be perfect in order to not be crowded out or to have the enemies just cut the rope you're on when you're in the middle of nowhere. This game does at least give birth to a fantastic mechanic, but it would definitely be used better later on. Here's another odd little game, 1986's Rock and Rage, also known as Hot Rock of Love, John, Rick and Sheena. You play as either John or Rick, and you have to jump into a whole other dimension in order to save Sheena, your bandmate. The game's title may sound like that of a dreadful mid noughties VH1 reality show where ladies compete for the attention of some faded husk of a hair metal star, but this game is a bit more interesting. You use a big guitar to beat up on the enemies and reflect their projectiles, the enemies are appropriately ludicrous, and your main character looks an awful lot like John Oates. It's not a brilliant game as the levels are maze-like and it can be a bit of a pain trying to make your way through them, but you can't help but have a bit of a smile at the presentation. Much like the earlier Mikey, Rock and Rage's soundtrack is full of FM recreations of popular hits. John Lennon, Falco, Bruce Springsteen and others are all represented here, and once again all of these covers are officially licensed through Jazzrack. Music is a big fin when it comes to marketing a lot of these Konami games. It is worth noting that quite a lot of the games featured here had their soundtracks officially released back in the day, including this one. We go all the way to 1989 for the 60th title, SPY, Special Project Y. Now there are two games in particular from this year that absolutely go the whole hog when it comes to ripping off James Bond and somehow getting away with it. Data East Sly Spy is one, and this is the other. You've got a very Bond-esque intro, a hero who's got to stop an evil organisation from launching a nuke, jetpacks and all sorts. However, Sly Spy is a much better game than this one. SPY is often thought of as a spiritual successor to the NES game Adventures of Bio Billy, with it largely consisting of beat em up action that is fairer than the aforementioned NES tile, but pretty damn generic for 1989 seeing as you can't do much except punch and kick. There's a couple of other sections to change things up. The best of these is a jetpack section that plays like it's straight out of Space Harrier, although obviously not quite as technically impressive. On the whole, yeah, this is all just quite mediocre. Not something you'd be likely to play again after giving it a quick once over. Here's Scooter Shooter from 1985. It seems to me that this might be the most obscure of Konami's 80s games to actually get a full release. Of all the games here, I can find virtually no information about it whatsoever beyond a single line saying it's a horizontal shooter where the characters are on flying scooters. That's it. 
there's absolutely nothing out there to the point where you wonder if the game actually got a proper release on the floor, although presumably it did have seen as it was one of various old Konami arcades to make an appearance on the old Xbox 360 game room service. Happily the game is available on MAME, even if no one can find any info about it. And yeah, it's an average one. The screen is split in half and you compete against the opponent, both of you making your way to the middle of the stage, blasting through the enemies and eventually coming together for a bit of a one-on-one -on -one shootout. It's not exactly the most memorable of games to say the least, which probably goes a ways to explaining why there's not been a lot of drive to find out much about it. A very rare game indeed, and not a bad one, but nothing to write home about. It's time for another biggie. In March 1981, Konami made their first huge breakthrough arcade. Released by Lee Jack and Stern, it's a huge step forward for the shoot 'em up genre, easily one of its most influential titles. Hell, without Scramble, the horizontal shoot 'em up as most people know it basically doesn't exist. Scramble is so influential because it's basically the first of its kind, the first horizontal shoot 'em up with a fixed scroll, the first that basically consists of one giant level with several different sections and a big goal at the end, surely the first to have a fuel system where you need to constantly be topping up your meter. Hell, even Namco's Exevious, a game that's almost as influential, doesn't happen without Scramble. Exevious uses the same combination of bullets and bombs for your jet that, once again, originated here. It's often said that Gradius wouldn't exist without Scramble, to the point where this game is often thought as Gradius Zero. However, I honestly think that undersells this game a little bit. The importance of Scramble to arcades as a whole cannot be overstated. And it does help that through all this influence, Scramble is still a joy to play. You've got that signature sound, the rapid movement between different sections that require using all the skills, whether it's sheer firepower or the precise movement needed in the enemy base, the satisfaction that comes from every well-placed bomb and close pass. This is the distilled, quintessential shoot 'em up the very heart of the genre. Little more needs to be said. With Scramble being such an immediate success, Konami were quick to put the hammer down on a sequel. In fact, Super Cobra hit the arcade floors mere weeks after Scramble, the pair representing a quick one-two punch that represented the future of shoot 'em up action in the arcades and beyond. And Super Cobra is… mainly more of the same. Although while it's obviously created in Scramble's engine and is very similar in many ways, there's a lot more variation here when it comes to both the enemies you face and the sections of the big level, seeing as there's now 11 of them as opposed to 6. Being a bigger game, Super Cobra definitely represents more of a challenge, which might be why Konami wanted to get it out so quickly. They wanted to keep up the fire before there was any chance of the majority of arcade goers learning and getting bored of the original Scramble. It is a bit forgiving in one way, mind you. Super Cobra is one of the first arcades to feature a limited amount of continues, a rarity in itself for Konami, especially this early on. This game wasn't quite as successful as the original Scramble, but it was still a very nice hit, and importantly, it's just as good. The road is long, with many a winding turn, especially when it's a Shaolin's road. <laughs> this here's a beat em up from 1985, and in North America this game was simply called Kicker, which is about as one a title as you can get for an arcade game. It does exactly what it says on the tin. Thought of as another spiritual successor to Yaya Kung Fu, Shaolin's Road sees you kick various goony enemies on a multi-level stage, while usually there's a stronger boss character lurking about. Some of these guys are similar to those that you would find in the aforementioned Yaya Kung Fu. 
It's quite a neat little game if you're into this sort of early beat-em-up, the likes of Kung Fu Master and what have you. You're at least able to survive a couple of hits, and it's nice to have a bit more freedom of movement as opposed to the usual single plane that you get in beat-em-ups of this vintage. You can't beat a few good old kicks to the teeth now, can you? Next up we have an early and very obscure game indeed called Space War. The Konami name's not actually on this at all. This is a 1979 game released by Lee Jack, but Konami definitely developed it. Or did they? There is a bit of confusion seeing as there's also a version of this same game released by Taito in Europe under the name of Space Laser, with the possibility of IWEM being involved. It also seems as if Sega had a license for this game too, although it wasn't used. All very odd, but then this sort of practice was common at the time. In these early days it often seems that games get licensed out by developers to far more than one publisher, even in the same territories. As for the game itself, it is actually a perfectly okay versus mode take on Space Invaders. You and either the computer or a second player try to zap each other through the lanes of alien ships that are blocking your shots. Very simple game, and probably a lot more fun with another human. Strategy X is another early game from 1981. It is kind of similar in ways to both Scramble and Super Cobra, although far more obscure than both. Basically, this is what happens when you take the Scramble formula and stick it into a top-down tank game. It's not a fixed scroller so you can move around at your leisure, but you can move where you like and rotate your turret as well. Much like Scramble, you've also got to keep an eye on your fuel. Just don't make the mistake of shooting the barrels as you would do in that game, as you've actually got to drive over them here. It's another pretty tough game with several different sections, although you do again get the option of continues here, which is at least a little bit of a mercy. While this game doesn't appear to have made much of an impact at all, I do find it pretty enjoyable. Perhaps I'm just a bit of a sucker for early tank style games like this one. It's been a little while since we've had a good old fashioned sports game, and 1984's Super Basketball allows us to take another trip to the court, although sadly there's no poorly sun version of the Star Spangled Banner this time. This isn't too bad for being such an early basketball title. It's quite streamlined in that it's almost entirely based on offence. You start each match a few points behind and you get to play several instances where you're in possession. If you go out of bounds or the defending team takes control of the ball, you simply move on to your next possession. Simplistic in many ways, especially when compared to the later likes of Double Dribble, but not exactly a bad fin when it comes to a pure arcade game of this vintage. It at least spares me the indignity of hopelessly thrashing about and trying in vain to steal the ball back from the computer. Not bad at all. Tactician is another very early game, from 1981. Much like Frogger, this was published by Sega and Gremlin, although obviously it's nowhere near as successful. There's a little depth to this space shooter. While the ships move around in the typical Galaxian formula, you start each round by putting down some defences in the shape of mines before the aliens start their attack. The first mine you put down does somewhat function as another attack. If you shoot it, you'll blow up all the remaining mines at once, which can be useful at points if there's a whole load of ships near the minefield. This spot of tactics does certainly make a difference compared to the usual space shooter, and helps to make Tactician a rock solid and very underrated title. This is an obscure Konami arcade indeed, but a very good one that I would absolutely recommend. We've still got a good few big titles to go in this video, and here, right at the end of the decade, 
Well, not many arcade games were bigger than 1989's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, if any. With this being the height of Turtle Mania and Konami's game being so damn good, TMNT ended up being one of the most successful arcade games released in quite some time. It was such a runaway hit that Konami could barely keep up with the demand for the game from operators, eventually selling around 25,000 units. Not Konami's biggest ever number, but a huge figure for an arcade game released in the second half of the decade. While the game itself doesn't exactly need a lot of hyping up, it is worth noting that TMNT, as a beat-em-up, isn't much more complex in terms of moves than the likes of Crime Fighters that preceded it. However, the presentation and the speed just makes all a difference, turning what was once an okay game into a great one. Suddenly, Konami are huge players in the world of beat-em-ups, and TMNT represents the formula that they would continue with well into the 1990s. One of the greatest and most successful licensed games ever made, with many a celebrated follow-up from Turtles in Time right up to the modern-day classic Shredder's Revenge. Thundercross from 1988 takes Konami back to the horizontal shooter formula that they were so damn good at, and this is very much a game in the classic style. You've got your ship, there's power-ups and options to be found all over the shop, so get to work. I'd say as far as Konami's arcade shooters go that this one plays a bit easier than the likes of Gradius and Salamander, so that may well appeal to you if those games are a bit too tough for your liking. The graphics are fine indeed, and the music? Well, that's bloody marvellous. This is some of the best Konami music you'll find from the whole decade. There is quite a cool fact here too, one that I found on Arcade History. You may find that the first level's music sounds familiar if you've seen your fair share of Amiga Cracktros. And that's because one of the all-time great Cracktro tunes, Olof Gustafsson's Horizon music for the Swedish Demoscene group of the same name, is based on the first level music for Thundercross. Listen for yourself. Both the original and Olaf's version obviously kick plenty of ass, and so does this game as a whole. Konami aren't exactly in the business of disappointing when it comes to horizontal shoot-em-ups, although it's a bit surprising that this one never ended up getting a home port. You've already seen that several of the Konami games we've covered here are amongst my all-time favourites, especially from the Golden Age period. Gyrus, Frogger, Scramble, and here's another one, Time Pilot from 1982. Yoshiki Okamoto's game is a multi-directional shooter that takes you through the ages, starting in 1910 against biplanes before moving on to helicopters, jets, and eventually ending up in the future space world of 2001 where you're trying to take down UFOs. Time Pilot's brilliance comes from throwing a lot of enemy numbers at you, but also giving you the abilities to consistently outmaneuver them, to twirl around, gracefully avoiding the enemy's shots, blowing them out of the skies even when you've got some homing missiles on your tail, perhaps picking up a few of the pilots on the way as they fall down in their parachutes. Just brilliant. And technically, it shouldn't even have happened. As Okamoto tells the story, he was supposed to be creating a game based on driving instruction, but he decided to plug away at this idea instead, relaying the code to his programmer while pretending to work on said driving game whenever his middle manager came snooping around. It's always nice when the origins of a great game come from sheer bloody-mindedness, isn't it? A spectacular title indeed. <laughs> Seeing as Time Pilot proved to be a success despite the initial annoyance of Okamoto's middle manager, who then ended up trying to take the credit for the game, much to Okamoto's own annoyance, it would eventually end up with a sequel, that being Time Pilot 84 from, well, 1984. 
This sequel largely keeps the same gameplay, but changes the premise somewhat. The subtitle of the game is Further Into Unknown World, meaning that you'll be warping to alien bases in space rather than being teleported through time periods, and also having some slightly more involved boss fights than the zeppelins and bombers you would find in the original. The gameplay in Time Pilot 84 is still very fine indeed, although I do think the game loses a little bit without its original premise. That was quite a novel one, whereas, well, this is more of a generic space shooter scene, really. As you might expect, Time Pilot 84 wasn't anywhere near as big of a hit as the original, although considering that the first game was released while the North American arcades were still in good commercial shape and this was released during the crash, that's not a huge surprise. Still a decent game, but I would rather play the original any day. So, there's one more pretty significant series of games to cover, an immensely loved sports title that's still a favourite in most arcades to this day. For sheer button-bashing satisfaction, it's hard to beat 1983's Track and Field. Not the first athletics game ever, but definitely the title that broke through huge, enough for the whole sports genre to be positioned right at the forefront of the arcades once again. It couldn't be simpler. No matter what the event, generally you're bashing your buttons alternately and then using the action button to do something, whether it's jumping over a hurdle, throwing a javelin, performing a long jump and so on, usually trying to hold that button down long enough to get the perfect angle. And even if the play was so simple, it couldn't have been more competitive. All manner of players were going against each other to try and get the perfect score, and Konami and Century took advantage by holding what was, for many years, officially the biggest video game competition of all time, the March of Dimes International Track and Field Challenge, a worldwide tournament in which over a million people took part. Another game where it's hard to overstate the impact it had, even outside of the sports genre. Track and Field is still a game that arcade goers happily flock to over 40 years after its original release. Naturally, such a huge game is going to get a sequel pretty sharpish, and Hyper Sports would come out in July 1984, just in time for the Los Angeles Olympics, and with a title that also calls back to the original game's name in Japan, Hyper Olympic. While a crash did affect this game's performance in the States compared to the original, it was still a big hit everywhere else, and it does come with seven entirely new events for the players to master. The games in Hypersports do have a bit more in the way of variation too. While you get more traditional button bashing and angles from the likes of swimming and triple jump, there's even more timing and precision involved in events like skeet shooting, archery, long horse and weightlifting. As with the first game, you also may end up getting big point bonuses if you either perform well or do things in a certain way, such as when you get the ultra-fast big bird coming out at the end of a perfect round in the shooting. A very fun sequel indeed that may well have a bit more endurance than the original thanks to its wider range of events. Four years later, Konami would go back to the track for another Olympic year, with the result being 88 games, or Hypersport Special if you're in Japan. You get nine events this time around, and most of them are track and field based. Indeed, you can find all of these events dotted around in the first two games aside from the big 4x400m relay. Even if 88 Games doesn't do much with the athletics formula beyond giving the graphics a big new updated coat of paint and adding a few cheeky advertisements for other Konami titles like Ajax and MX5000 to the hoardings, it's not a bad update of a formula that obviously still works pretty well, although Konami would end up making a much more famous update of it a few years later when they made international track and field and brought their brand of Olympic action into the world of 3D. This is still a pretty significant series of games in the end, even if the latter two entries we've looked at didn't end up coming close to the runaway success of the original. Distance 67.18 meters. 
Our next title is Trick Trap 1771 from 1988, also known as Labyrinth Runner. Another quite obscure one compared to the giants of this video, and another game that never left the arcade. What we have here is a pretty straightforward run and gunner with a fantastical theme. You're shooting sandworms, spectres and other assorted creations rather than the usual soldiers and tanks. Generic? Yes, but it doesn't play particularly badly. You get three weapons at your disposal that you can switch between, a regular gun, a laser and a bomb, and you can power these up along with your speed. Sometimes one particular weapon can be useful in a certain situation, although a lot of the time the weapon that you choose does come down more to personal preference. This ends up being a bit like the earlier Rock and Rage, only with much less weirdness. It's not a badly made game at all, but there's not a whole lot here that would really entice you to play the game any more than a couple of times. Even as we near the end of the list, we still have some quite significant games to look at, and here's another big one. Tutankham was another success for Konami in 1982, and in a roundabout way it had a huge influence on the maze shooter style of video game, being the game that heavily inspired computer games such as Dandy and Time Bandit, which in turn were the games that heavily inspired Gauntlet. Your budding Howard Carter is making his way through the Egyptian tomb in search of untold treasure, but he must be wary of the various asps, parrots, bats and other assorted creatures that lie within. They spawn endlessly from generators, acting as a defence against would-be grave robbers. You have a flash stick that can take out these enemies, along with a couple of very limited flash bombs, but the stick can only be used horizontally, meaning that any trip through a vertical tunnel is fraught with danger. Tutankham is a tough game indeed, but the risk and reward of braving the game's tunnels and timing a daring run to get that extra treasure or the key that you need to progress makes it a very engrossing title. There's not many games like this one where you're constantly switching from being easily able to take out all enemies to being virtually defenceless, and this is a mechanic that Tutankham pulls off very well. A great little golden age game. Our next title is the original Twinbee from 1985. The arcade version of this game only came out in Japan. It's a vertical shoot 'em up, but not as people back then would have known them. Here everything's bright and full of colours. This game, along with Sega's Fantasy Zone, represents the birth of the cute 'em up subgenre of shooters, and it is a pretty good one. The main gimmick here is the bells that act as power-ups depending on the colour they are, and that changes depending on how many times they've been shot. Other than that, Twinbee's got similar core gameplay to Exevious with the ability to use both bullets and bombs for ground-based enemies, and technically it's a very solid entry into the shoot 'em up genre as a whole that's also got a bit of influence. The Twinbee series would largely stay home after this one with games for the Famicom, MSX and the like, although there would be a couple of other arcade Twinbee games in the 1990s. <laughs> Now this next game surely must be the most obscure entry here, Ultra Invaders from 1980. You may look at this and think that it appears quite familiar, and well yeah, it's just Space Invaders, exactly the same as the original arcade. Obviously that game needs no introduction, but why does this even exist, and why is it under Konami's name? Now that's a tough one. Way back when I covered Astro Fighter, near the start of this video, I mentioned a rather short-lived publisher from Osaka called Leejack. When Konami, also based in Osaka, started to make their way into arcade games, they worked with Lem. Leejack were responsible for licensed variants of a few popular titles. Here's Spacekin, another Invaders variant that plays the exact same, although it has Katakano at the top of the screen and the sprites have been changed a little, more so than Ultra Invaders at any rate. Anyway, Konami gradually took over Lee Jack's business in 1979 and 1980, although a good chunk of Konami's earliest games would be published in Japan under the name, including the likes of Scramble. <laughs> <laughs> 
However, by about the middle of 1981, Konami stopped using the Lejak brand entirely. Now, I reckon that this Ultra Invaders title is one of the last vestiges of Lee Jack's licensing of more successful games, only released under the Konami name as they gradually took things over. That would be my guess anyway. As we get near to the end of this epic video, it's worth tying up a few little loose ends. Mainly a couple of intriguing looking 80s Konami games that aren't playable for whatever reason, largely because they were never released. First off, this wouldn't be a fully complete A to Z without mentioning Konami's contributions to Nintendo's Versus system and Play Choice 10. While it's hardly worth covering them in full as they're just NES games in an arcade cabinet, a fair few Konami titles were available on there, from the NES versions of games like Contra and Gradius to others such as The Goonies, Castlevania and Top Gun. There's also a couple of Konami games that were at one point definitely supposed to be arcades, although they did come out in other forms, the most famous and best one of these undoubtedly being Comic Bakery. There is a listing for this game as an arcade, but no PCB of it has ever been dumped, it may well have never come out at all. However, the game would be a success on the MSX, as well as on the C64, where it comes with a fantastic Martin Galway soundtrack. The same also applies to Sky Jaguar, a kind of generic vertical shoot 'em up which was supposed to have an arcade version, but did at least arrive on the MSX. There is also a South Korean port of the game for the Master System, similar to the SMS port that exists for Road Fighter. It's still murky as to whether these ports were licensed or if they were bootlegs, probably the latter. As far as completely unreleased titles go, well, Max Mile is still the most intriguing one, Konami's other Laserdisc game. The Flyer is interesting for sure, apparently you'd have played as a secret agent protecting the Earth from a giant evil pig, and it's said that the game would have featured sprites or animations superimposed onto footage that was shot in actual cities. Very odd indeed. However, beyond that, this Laserdisc title remains a total enigma. Hopefully it, along with the arcade versions of Comic Bakery and Sky Jaguar, end up surfacing someday. We've got another really early game here, 1981's Video Hustler. It's… well, it's an early pool game, obviously, although one that was actually cloned a great deal. As is the norm, you get several chances to pot a ball, and you lose a life if you don't knock anything down in three shots, or if you scratch the cue ball. Very basic, although I actually find this one more fun than the later rack em up that we looked at before. Partly because I think the aiming system here actually works a bit better for doing more with the ball, and also because you do get the addition of multipliers for each of the pockets. It is quite cool to actually get a times 10 multiplier on a shot, even if a lot of times it just happens by accident. You miss the shot you actually went for, but end up getting that instead. There's not exactly tons to say here, but it's not all that bad considering that it's a 43 year old take on Pocket Billiards. We've got one more trip to the track. It's WEC Le Mans 24 from 1986, a game that Konami actually only published, with the developing work being done by Corland and Alpha Denshi. Racing games have always been one of the driving forces of the arcade experience, and this is most definitely Konami's high profile contribution to the genre in the 80s. Something that's sort of going for a hybrid of arcade and simulation, possibly not quite as fidgety as Namco's juggernaut pole position, but a little more in depth than contemporaries like Sega's Outrun. A lot of this has to do with the game's main environmental cabinet. Konami weren't generally one for the spectacular cabs in the 1980s, but this one's quite cool. It's known as the Big Spin Cabinet, and it looks a fair bit like a repainted and modded waltzer cart. Shoutouts to Old Style Gaming for that reference. The gimmick is that the whole cab spins with the movement of the wheel, and it can be quite violent with it too, particularly on the sharper turns. Now I've never had the pleasure of seeing one of these cabs in the flesh, sadly, but it certainly looks like a good bit of body motion fun, the sort of deluxe cab that Sega helped make all the rage. 
the game itself is a perfectly fine spot of racing, definitely superior to other efforts like Konami GT. Our second to last entry is something quite obscure again. It's Whiz Quiz. This is, as the title suggests, a quiz game. Pick a subject and get quizzing. Nothing more, nothing less, with very basic presentation. I suspect this may be another game that Konami just published rather than developed, seeing as it's also got a release through UK-based publisher Xylex Zenitone, and the game does strike me as being rather British in tone. There is virtually nothing to say here, although it's funny when you get a question one and your wizard gets a dunce cap dropped on his head. I suppose I should be thankful that Konami didn't release a bunch of bloody Mahjong games. And so we reach our 84th and final entry. Whew. And yeah, we're ending on a high point. The last game is another big, influential cornerstone, an essential early title in the fighting game genre. It's Yaya Kung Fu from 1985. You play as Oolon and make your way through 11 opponents using your rapid fists and feet, leaping all over the shop and striking with all manner of moves, from straight kicks to back fists, jumping kicks to the splits. Before Yaya Kung Fu, there was never a fighting game with this much speed to go along with the variety of moves at your disposal, although it is perhaps mostly recognised as the first fighting game to feature a health bar system, something which became standard after this title. As important as that is, the ease and quickness of Yaya Kung Fu is the main thing that still makes it a fun game to play now when so many of its contemporaries have lost their luster due to age. You can still have a damn good time with this one, looking for those openings and, and besting each opponent regardless of any weapons that they may be packing. It's another classic game and it's a great way to finish off this list. <laughs> And there we are, that's Konami's 1980s arcade games. It's certainly been an epic journey, but that's no more than this selection deserves. Even if I was familiar with a fair few of these games already, putting so many classics in one video really goes to show just how largely excellent and important Konami's arcade output was in this decade. I mean, just imagine what gaming as a whole would look like if none of these titles ever existed. It doesn't bear thinking about, does it? Not only that, so many of these games are still worth playing, and hopefully you've also been made aware of some excellent titles that you might not already be familiar with. In any case, I do hope you've enjoyed this big old arcade trip, and until the next time, bye for now. <laughs>